Welcome everyone to another SATAA webinar. Um, today we've got Debbie Robinson with us. Debbie, I'm delighted that you're part of our local SATAA um, webinar series. Um, to introduce Debbie, gosh, Debbie, I think we've known each other for, I was thinking, 10 years-ish, at least. Be. Yeah. Um, so Debbie and I have been in a peer TA group meeting maybe four times a year, sometimes in person. And the last time in the era when travel was still allowed, it was in your home in France, which was a wonderful few days. Um, I've really got to know Debbie as... Um, a woman who's passionate, who's creative, um, works with integrity, really loves her TA, um, has a concern for those less privileged in, in some of the work that she's done. Those are the things that have impacted me. I remember, Debbie, in your um, teach cry out in our group for your TSDA, the, the amazing creativity. I think you played with the integrating adult with, with mm. beautiful things we had to hold. So I'm really curious to see what you bring. Um, I don't think I've got a, a lot of flavor of you in your actual professional role as an organizational transactional analyst. I've got a really deep sense of you as a trainer and an amazing supervisor. When you supervise, I also learn a lot and notice the, the empathy, the depth, the integrity and the potency of inviting the reflection. So I'm delighted to get a snapshot into your your other work in uh, working. I know groups, TA groups are groups, but I'm sensing more as well mm -hmm. with your work in organizations. I think I know everyone on the call um, in various ways. Leona, we haven't met a lot, but uh, I certainly I've got to know you through your last SATAA webinar. So over to you, Debbie. Brilliant. Wow. What an introduction, Karen. I feel thoroughly stroked before I begin. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, and thank you. Yeah, it has been a delight over the last 10 years to work together. Um, yeah, and maybe a little bit of an introduction around me. So, yeah, I'm an organisational transactional analyst. Um, it's taken me about 20 years to be able to say that without stumbling over the words, because it's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, Karen, you said about my work in organisations. So um, it's been quite, it's quite diverse, my work in organisations. I, I think uh, I, my background started out um, in local government. Um, so uh, my first profession was uh, environmental health. Um, so it was public service and it was looking after the issues in the community that could impact people's health before they entered the health system. Um, so public health would pro perhaps be a better way of putting it. Um, and I came up through the ranks there and uh, I became director of a local authority and I was uh, a corporate director of that local authority for uh, about 12 years um, and in that time came across TA um, and I came across TA in, counts, uh, in counselling. I had some personal issues, um, went to a TA practitioner, not really knowing what TA was um, and I'm very glad to say resolved my personal issues using TA and what I found was that within my work as a, as a manager and a leader, I would have TA popping up and I'd be using it within my work and that got me really curious and that's when I started my TA training um, because I was really curious about okay if I find these concepts useful how can I learn more about using them in organizations um, so I then left and, and became independent consultant um, and I would say now I predominantly work with small to medium-sized companies um, often at two ends of the spectrum, those that are expanding very quickly, um, which tend to be technology related, where suddenly an idea becomes viable and they move from maybe being half a dozen people to being 60 people and the structures and communication just doesn't work anymore. Um, and uh, so they're looking for means by which they can actually um, put structures in place which enable 
communication and a free flow and the creativity. And at the other end of the scale, um, it, it's also perhaps when you've had acquisitions or mergers or hostile takeovers and you've got organisations which are downsizing, they may be very demoralised. Um, how do you then actually support people to be resilient in those sorts of settings? Um, and, um, and again, I've, I've really enjoyed my work there because people rediscover if you like their autonomy and their resilience and their capabilities and and make contact with their autonomy rather than going to that position of passivity or negative adapted child where they feel hopeless and helpless so really two two extremes in terms of what i do and I think if we talk about what we're here to, today to talk about, I use co-creativity a lot. I, I think it is part of my fundamental belief that we are better together than we are individually. Um, I know I am better when I am connected to others, supporting and supported by others. Um, and, and so co-creativity, co-creative TA was one of those where it's like oh that's what I've been doing now I know what to call it <laughs> um, and I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you read a piece of theory and you think oh, but that's what I do yeah um, and and that's what it was like for for me with co-creative TA um, so it sort of has filters in all of my work um, and that is why the title of this seminar, From the Individual to the Collective, really attracted me. Um, because I think often our focus in our work, coaching, education, organisations, with therapy, with counselling, the focus is often on the individual. Um, removing self-limiting beliefs, enabling them to realize their potential or, you know, in counseling and therapy to, to help them resolve issues that are getting in their way. Um, so the focus is very individual and looking at autonomy and personal development. And I actually think we are what we are through our relationships. And yes, absolutely, as individuals, um, we bring our own uniqueness to the relationships. But without the relationships and the interconnectedness, we fail to reach our full potential. Um, so that's sort of why I like the idea of moving from individual to, to um, connectedness, because I think it's such a powerful um, way of looking at the world. And it was interesting a couple of years ago, um, I did some work out in Kiev and there was a lady in the group and she was very quiet. You know, you got sort of that sense of presence and somebody really struggling to be in the group. And I talked to her about it. And she said, I've got a problem with weeness. Um, she said, I grew up under the Stalin regime. And weeness has a very different meaning to me. Um, because to be we, you were expected to give up your individuality and your autonomy. Um, and so it was really fascinating working with her in terms of how does the concept of autonomy and collective sit next to one another? Yeah. How, how can we together be more because you are individual and unique and able to realize your potential? Um, so it was, it was a real cultural, oof, you know, in terms of yeah, I hadn't ever really considered the impact of me talking about weenies um, with somebody who had, had suffered under that regime. 
So there you go. Introduction to me, introduction to a little bit of why I'm here and what, what I want to share with you. And I'm curious about what would you like to get from the next hour and 40 minutes? Yeah. What is it that you would really like to take away as a treasure and think, oh, yes, that was worth those two hours. And we're a small enough group that we can do that, which is brilliant. So what's the golden nugget that might be there for you today? So I think when I'm jumping onto these webinars, as well as my natural interest in, in the world of coaching and in the world of TA, I, I also always love the cultural piece and the fact that I'm sat here in the UK and there's colleagues in the room that are from around the world. And, and for me, that, that also gives the entwining a, a deeper mm -hmm. definition. So, so for me, I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I know the words about what the outcome is, but by virtue of the fact that I'm in here entwining myself with different cultures, I'm going to trust the process and know there will be something that along the journey that I'll just grab and that will be okay. my nugget. Hmm. That's a really lovely expression, Leslie, the entwining of the cultures. So, uh, yeah, I get a sense of what excites you. Maybe um, when you I spoke just, about the... Sorry, go Karen. Thank you. When you spoke about the Kiev woman and um, her understanding of weeness reminded me of um, work I've done in Japan, where looking at weeness and how is it not symbiotic, because the mm -hmm. Japanese culture is quite symbiotic. Um, so I guess what, what, what I'm curious about is how do we hold the, the tension between almost seeming opposites, autonomy yeah. and harmonomy, um, the individual and the collective. Um, stimulating different thinking for me along that line is always useful. Lovely. That's nice, Karen. Okay. Yeah, I just, sorry, just to add as well, Karen, the, um, I, I, it's similar to you, just it's what you said, Debbie, was how can we be more because you are individual it was incredibly powerful for me. Um, I train, I always say I train individuals in a group situation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's, I, um, I, I really, I'm looking forward to hearing that dynamic of how do you maintain autonomy um, and then also create harmony within the collective. Um, and putting it into a lens from from where I'm coming from in a training space where I'm trying to get people in a group situation to get individual learnings that whatever I throw up in the air lands for them and they're allowed to be different landing, you know, what's what's landed for them. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Sorry, Leo. And Lovely. I you, you were first anyway, Clive. Yeah, for me working in organizations and with teams it's always a challenge uh, to get the people in a space that they let go of what they know and get into this co-creative process so it's coming from a place of not knowing um, and yeah it's sort of uh, inviting others to get into that space so this is always a challenge for me and I'm curious to, you know, is there a, have you, you know, is there any experience on how to do that? Um, yeah, so that's, that will be a golden nugget for me. Okay, I don't have a magic wand. I can certainly share some experiences and yeah. some ideas. Um, and, and I suppose for me, it's about inviting people to reduce their defensiveness. Um, that often when we move into a collective, our defenses go on high alert. Um, and, and so it's how can we invite people to, uh, to maybe let reduce some of that defensiveness and allow themselves to be in now bubble. So, but yeah, we'll perhaps talk a bit more about that, Leona, thank you.
Anybody else? Okay, so it's TA, so I need to do that contract bit, yeah? I can't really go any further without the contract bit. So I would like to make it part of what we're doing, if that's okay with you. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, she says, let's uh, gone to the end. So let's go to the beginning, shall we? Okay. So can you all see that? Please say yes. Yes. Ah. Lovely. Thank you. That's brilliant. Okay, so, so I thought it was worth when we looked at this, because we could spend a lot of time contracting, yeah, um, and two hours isn't that long. So I thought I would do a, a sort of starter for 10 that we could uh, have a have a look round. Um, and some of you have talked about being familiar and enjoying co-creative TA, and, and some of you may not be fully aware of the idea of co-creative TA. So I thought it was worth just sort of revisiting the principles. And one of the main principles is weeness. And we've already started having a bit of discussion about what do I mean and what do we mean by weeness. Um, and one of the other important aspects is the shared responsibility. And I so like this one. It is so nice to think that I am not responsible for how all of you experience today. Yeah, that, that actually we can share that experience and cre create something really valuable between us. Um, and it's not equal because obviously, um, Kirsty, Alex, Karen, Andrew have had part of the responsibility of organizing the webinar, the technical aspects, the administrative aspects and all of that sort of thing. Um, and I've had the responsibility of collecting a few things together in a toolbox that we might want to explore together. Yeah. Um, but equally, you have a responsibility around your own and another's learning. And then unconditional positive regard. And this is something so I haven't said, but I'm married and my other half is a TA person as well. Um, and he wrote an article for TAJ last year, which added this aspect of unconditional positive regard to the principles of co-creativity. Um, and so there's something around having positive regard for ourselves and also each other that is really important to this process. So my suggestion is that we have a look at this contract and see what you think. That we we learn together, and I I am excited about learning from you and working with you, um, and hopefully you will learn from me and enjoy the process of of working with me. Um, that you will willingly bring your knowledge and experience and a preparedness to contribute that um, to enhance and enrich our learning experience. That we will invite and seek to be in the here and now. Yeah, that that's where we will endeavor for our learning to happen. And there may be times, I'm sure there will be times when we may go to there and then, yeah, that we may not, we may get touched by something, we may find ourselves rubber banded back to something else, maybe some, some of those injunctions might start stirring up. And, and it's about noticing and accounting for that, yeah. Um, and and being resourceful enough to either process for yourself or to share it with the group or make a note and take it away and, and get some support through supervision or something. Yeah, so just be aware and, and account for those experiences. And then treating each other and ourselves with respect. Yeah, we're all we're all really great individuals, um, and we're here 
to, to learn about TA and we all have our thoughts and experiences around TA and it will be the whole process will be best if we can respect those of ourselves and of each other. So how does that land with people? What do you reckon? Is there something you want to add, something you want to take away? For me, it really sounds great. <laughs> I wouldn't want to take anything away. No. Okay. So does it help you move into our bubble, Leona? Um, you know, it, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whilst whilst we were going through this, I just felt like there was a sort of a ah, a sort of a, a, a I don't know, sort of a relief and let go of everything and just be. I just really mm -hmm. literally felt it in my body. Felt it in your body. Yeah. And what was it that enabled you, do you think? I think we were talking about uh, noticing and accounting for past experiences. Because at the beginning, you know, when, we, when you asked about, uh, so what would you like, you know, what would be the golden nugget? And then immediately I was like, oh my gosh, I have to think of something, you know, and get a, and, and, and uh, I have to actually do, do something now. And, and that was like a trigger. Oh yes, this is, this is, you know, I notice, I, I recognize this. Um, and um, just being able to express that, that really helps already. So um, yeah, it, it just, it, it feels like a relief to be able to do this and, and work together with people in this way. Yeah. I think um, and feel that this contract is starting to create the weeness in our group. And um, just by listening to Leona sharing quite transparently and vulnerably has made me feel more connected and mm -hmm. open to my own, or open to sharing myself. So it feels like a good contract. And it's really interesting that you, you talk about feeling, Alex, um, because I think that is so important as part of the contract, that it, it feels okay to be in this space. Yeah. Um, because often when we're in groups, as I said to Leona earlier, our defences can pop up. You know, we're on, we're on that alert for you know, what might, where might I not be okay in this situation? Um, and so there's something about reminding people that they are okay. Um, and, and through that okayness, we can find a way together. Hmm. Because if I just cognitively agreed with a contract, I wouldn't be engaging all of myself. And I think the weeness that it's, it's more than just a, an acknowledgement that there are others in the same space. It is about empathy and belonging, um, feeling connected, supportive, and also being open to challenging each other's ideas. Yeah, I think that the challenge is important as well um, to so that sort of if we're all feeling very cozy and only say the things that are uh, that we think people are going to like, then you lose the learning edge, you lose the growth. Um, and so that so that challenge is really important. Um, to challenge others as well as ourselves and that to be okay. Yeah, that's, um, that's 
true intimacy because then we're not aiming to please other people, which which is not intimacy. No, that can be the the space that blocks us from intimacy. Um, it's like we need to bring our rough edges with us. Um, you know, and when I was preparing for this, I'm thinking South Africa, you know, um, it has a much better sense of community and connectedness in some respects than European countries do. That I, certainly the UK seems quite diabolical at, at connectedness at the moment. And there was that moment of, oh, who am I to talk about this to people from India and South Africa who culturally have a much better sense of connectedness. So, you know, the, that process of actually, yeah, and still there may be things that I can say and offer that will be valuable to others. Now, I guess it's making me think as, as I'm listening to people talk here, that actually we don't all come in through the feeling door um, and no. it's making me think about the doors of contact. So, so I'm immediately knowing me sitting in that more cognitive space, knowing that my, uh, my feeling place doesn't open up initially and it will take a lot more before I go to that space. No. Um, so again, I, th I think, you know, when you're looking at the, the title and collectiveness, it's probably worth saying, or certainly from where I'm sitting, there'll be people in groups that are in different spaces within that connectedness initially as well. So you, there's, there's something about the contract that, or contracts that we might co-create where we have to break through some of that somehow mm -hmm. to be in similar spaces. Break through. I would say invite into. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's really important that, that people travel at their own pace. Um, and, and if you like, our job is to seek to create an environment where they want to connect. Um, and at where... the same time, isn't that one of the tensions in organisations where you're given the two hour <laughs> slot to achieve a miracle? <laughs> yeah, just, just, yeah, it's different, isn't it? Horses for courses as well. It is. And I think there's something about authenticity around that um, in that actually voicing whether it's a realistic expectation to create miracles in two hours um, is, is part of the process that enables people to say, I've not, I've not got to deliver that miracle. So I'm going to move on a slide because there are also some permissions which Paul came up with in his article. And, and this came out of working with a number of groups and finding out what was it that sort of made a difference. Um, and I, was, I wasn't sure whether to add these in today, but having met you all and had started the discussion, it, it feels really valuable, actually. Um, because it's got, it's okay to challenge if we don't agree. Yeah, it's okay to challenge me, to challenge other authority figures that you might perceive in the room, um, and, and to be able to look at things from different perspectives. And another really important one for me is it's okay to change um, and to be different to how you've been in the past. You know, it's okay in this space to try out and practice um, and find out what, what works for you and, and what doesn't work for you and maybe be a bit creative in a way um, that you haven't felt able to in the past. Um, and look back and, and maybe rewrite some of that past and look at it slightly differently. So these aren't permissions that I'm giving you. They are permissions that I'm offering you to consider. Ones that I have found helpful um, and others have found helpful. And, and maybe one will land with you and maybe it won't.
Okay, so before we move on from the contract, is there anything, any, any discomfort anybody's sitting with that you're, you would uh, sort of like to just put out there and share anything that you're not, obviously from a confidentiality point of view, it's being recorded. So it'd be really great for you to be mindful of that in terms of your sharing. Um, the, you know, the recording does mean that other people will be able to listen to what we're saying and, and doing here together. Um, but uh, anything else that anybody would like to? Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share for just a moment. So in terms of what we're gonna do in the next hour or so, um, I think, as I said in my little blurb, that I thought it'd be helpful to look at co-creative script. Um, and it's sort of almost like going from, from a range of people down to the individual and then back out from the individual to the collective. Yeah, we go from collective to individual to collective. Um, because my sense and the sense of a co-creative script is that it, it is not it is a more community experience than just the caregivers of the child um, and that it is an ongoing process and that we are open to those influences as we go through life so i thought a look at co-creative script um, and and i use the peacock as a metaphor so i i would like to share the metaphor of the peacock with you to see if it helps you take this forward into your different work environments. Because um, co-creative script can be a bit of a mouthful and a bit of a complicated diagram to show people in organizations. Um, so I thought maybe I could share that. Um, and that we'd do a couple of exercises if you're up for that. Um, and then look at something fairly specifically organizational if you want to towards the end. So that's my idea in terms of, for those of you that like structure, that's the sort of structure that I'm thinking of. And because it's as much your show as my show, if we end up going down a different alley, then that's okay with me. Yeah, if we become interested and we want to explore something, then that's really great. I'm not going to stick to a fixed agenda. Is that enough structure for people? Yeah, I'm getting nods. Fantastic. <sighs> yeah, I do a lot of this because if I'm working in a different language, you know, most people can get that. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether you speak Russian or Japanese or whatever, then um, that is fairly universal. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. Oop, you have my controls. Let's try that. There we go. All right. So a little. Again, maybe we can just do the thumbs up or thumbs down. Are you familiar with the idea behind the co-creative script from Summers and Tudors? Getting some nods. Anybody not? Okay, Clive. All right. I will give a little introduction. So normally within the script, um, and I'm happy to let you have these slides. Um, I'll let the association have them and they can distribute them if that's okay with the association. Yeah. Um, so traditional TA, when we think of script, tends to think of script as being the caregivers doing unto the small person, that the small person is quite powerless in the situation. Um, and what Summers and Tudors said was, actually they think there is adaptation on both sides. And for any of you that have been new parents or new grandparents, actually life changes for the adults um, when 
a baby arrives. Yeah, there are all sorts of changes that have to be accommodated and different ways of doing things. So one of the big changes in what Summers and Tudors talked about was the fact that actually this script formation is a two way process. Um, that the parents are adapting as much as the child is adapting. It's quite true that there is a power differential because, because the young person, the baby, um, doesn't have the developed skills that adults have, so it doesn't have as much power. Um, but what they also went on to say was, it's not just the primary caregivers that influence script. Yeah, and, and they talk about a number of ways in which, as we develop our own script, we are influenced by different cultural and societal influences. Um, and the ones that they, they chose to use were all females and all males, all white and all black, all heterosexual and all homosexual. And I think they are key aspects of what builds our personality. Um, and, and I think it is also possible to feed in other cultural influences and look at how our script develops. Yeah, so, so this is looking not just as script being a product of the primary caregivers and the child, but more of an influence as we grow to powerful people, powerful beliefs, power, powerful cultural and social impacts in terms of how we turn out. Um, and um, Leslie talked about the intertwining of different cultures across the world. And, and a lot of that intertwining is about how within our script, we are brought up, exposed to, different beliefs and different systems. Does that land, does that make sense for you in terms of co-creative script? Is that enough? Yeah. Okay. So I started to look at this in terms of a cultural setting. If you, if you looked at what might be important to how we develop, um, I started to, to think about how do we as individuals, yeah, this is where we move from the connectedness into the individual. How, does, how do these different groups and beliefs and opinions um, and experiences affect the development of script? Um, and these were some of the things that I came up with. Yeah, we have our female family and we have our male family, whatever family might mean. Um, but those people that were caregivers to us as we grew up and remain part, an important part of our per, interpersonal relationships now. Yeah, what, what are the influences that they have particularly in terms of how we develop as individuals. Um, our ethnicity and gender identity, both of these are really important. You know, they are really significant in how we develop as individuals. Yeah, how do I, we identify ourselves from a gender point of view and, and make sense of that in our world? Um, and what's the impact of our ethnicity? in the world in which we are growing up, living, interacting. So those, those were really important. And then I think as we grow up, schooling is such a significant part of um, how we develop our social relationships. You know, how do we believe we can interact? What are our beliefs about ourselves? What about our beliefs about others? We start to see people who are cleverer, less clever, you know, popular, more alone. We see we're exposed to different sorts of social interaction. Um, and that can have a huge impact, maybe on changing from the family script or maybe reinforcing the family script. 
And as part of that process, we also then start to develop friends and peers. Um, and I think Andrew said, we're in a group of like-minded people. Yeah, that's a really powerful influence, isn't it? If you start to find some people who have the similar sorts of interests, have maybe similar values, that can be so powerful in either sort of enabling you to become more autonomous and become and realize your potential or making you withdraw and maybe feel you don't quite belong or somehow you've got it wrong or you are wrong yeah so that that process of of how we develop our social relationships i think could be really important What are your thoughts and feelings about that then? Maybe. Um, sorry, Joanna. No, go ahead, Alex. Like sorry, Alex. Okay, thanks. Um, it seems to look at things through the perspective of nurture which is fine. And it doesn't seem to look at things through the perspective of nature. Mm -hmm. And I'm just noticing that without yeah. inferring any value judgment on its validity or anything like that. Yeah. And I, I think nature does play a huge part. Um, and I suppose when I when I talk about TA and I talk about theories, um, I adopt the view that that theory is like a story. If it's a story that helps you make meaning, then it is a valuable theory. Yeah. If it doesn't throw insights or help you make meaning, then it's OK to move on and find another one that does. Yeah. So I think that nurture nature, I think if the permission is there for somebody's nature to find a different story or a different way of expressing things, that's OK. Yeah. Um, so I think what I'm saying is I think you're right, Alex, it, it doesn't account very much for nature. And I think the contract that we talked about, um, I hope, actually says that if this is if this doesn't sit comfortably with your nature, then it's okay. It's not your nature that's not okay. I think that's probably mm. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was. Um, I've, I've been through this process before, really knowing about co-creative TA. But uh, once I started writing my CTA and the part of my personal journey, that I was just looking through the lens of. Um, and I talked about my su my supervisor, who's actually says, "Do you either pathologize or do you create?" a new story that that is helpful and i was looking through the lens of um uh, mainly how i've been influenced by my parents and also by my you know my siblings and uh, really looking at the limitations that I came from that and trying to um sort of discover so what was going on with me and then he invited me to look through the lens of co-creativeness -co and looking at this, uh, then other elements came into my story that I just just hadn't really looked at when I looking through the lens of the pathology, say. So uh, which friends had influenced me, or what which teachers had, you know, the schooling part and and all of a sudden this really different story emerged. Brilliant. So, so this is really a, a, a nice way of, of, of also talking about it and looking at it also when I started to understand. So what am I doing with my clients uh, if I'm not if I'm not uh, showing that it can be 
uh, you can look through a different lens. So that really changed, it changed, and I, I really love it. <laughs> so that, that's what it does to me when I'm looking at this. I changed my story. It's a lovely, yeah. lovely example, and thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, sorry. You want to go, Kirsty? Uh, okay, sure. I'll be quick. Um, yeah. So what was coming up for me is I'm I'm pregnant at the moment and due with my first in about a month's time. So congratulations! That's congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so that's obviously what's top of mind for me at the moment, and I think my first knee jerk reaction to all of it was the amount of responsibility that I feel to influence in a positive way all the different influences <laughs> that are going to mm -hmm. be impacting on my little one um and then listening to um leona share now i was reminded that actually the influence goes both ways and then i was thinking oh this little person is going to be influencing all of these different aspects too and that's quite interesting and i felt a bit of the responsibility lift off my shoulder, shoulders and felt almost more curiosity as to, well, what's her, and funny actually speaking about nature versus nurture, what's her natural nature mm -hmm. going to be that's going to influence that? Um, yeah, so I think that's that's kind of the journey I just went through in my head. That's brilliant, Kirsty. And, and, you know, the nature of the little one will influence hugely um you only have to to look at twins and siblings who have very similar parenting and take very different messages from it um you know so i think that the nature um and how that nature develops is important um and it's around giving the opportunity um for that nature to to be nurtured and I think also for me, finding some balance around responsibility to influence, um, you know, I can yeah. choose which school she goes to, but I can't <laughs> choose her friends or peers. So, you know, nope. I mean. yeah, so it's interesting. I'm struck by the potential force for um, really different points of view and messages to be coming from different groups. So how we're we're probably constantly, you know, is it this, is it that, and and how does that impact? Is it is it a cause for real turmoil, and almost that downward spiral of ah, it's too complicated, or is that the actual nudge for almost synthesizing something new out of seeming differences mm. that are coming from different aspects of maybe family, peers, um, society, etc. And I guess that's our choice of how, how do we use that how discomfort. Do we use it? And I'm thinking of Mesereau's disorienting dilemma that that's yep. where change can happen in a sense. Absolutely. I guess. Yeah, I, I think when we find that moment where you've got to either tread the well-trodden path and and if you like go with some of your past strategies or that discomfort about do i try something new do i take a new path um is is one of the key key parts of learning i think um and uh, you know that that actual process of being able to take the step into the unknown the um, chaotic space. So one of the ways in which I seek to make this a little more um, palatable, manageable, um, is I use the metaphor of a peacock. And I know I'm not the first one to have done that. Um, but it seems to me that, that sometimes if we can view ourselves as a peacock and we've got these beautiful feathers and we may have some brown and dingy feathers, yeah, um, and we sometimes tuck our feathers behind us and hide them away so that other people can't see them. And sometimes we only put certain of our feathers on display, so to speak. Um, 
And, and that process of choice is one of our related to our personality. Yeah. But it also impacts how we show up in a collective. Yeah. What is it that we choose to to show up with and show? What is it that we maybe sit on or tuck behind us out of view? Yeah. Um, and so I use this peacock metaphor to talk to people about how we might show up in a collective or a group. Um, and if we look at the at it as if it is a, a script helix, we can maybe start to identify some of the characteristics of the tail feathers that we either hide or show up with. Yeah. Um, and um, so I'm going to invite you to maybe do a bit of an exercise if you are up for it. Okay. And that's to consider a collective or a group that you are part of. Um, and to think about the peacock metaphor and see if you could name some of the people that have contributed to your tail feathers. Yeah. Um, so I did want to just sort of give you a bit of an example of my, my own sort of process. Um, so, you know, if I think about a female family member and, and who's, who would I like to um, be seen to be like or um, behave in a way that I feel would be really good in a group? And I would come up with my Nan Smith. We, that's what we called her, Nan Smith. She was my mum's mum. Yeah. And if I think about schooling, I think about my sixth form master, Mr. Hickford, and he gave so many permissions um, to explore um, and find out about things that actually that really gave me permission to be curious and, and to follow some of my curiosity. So just the, does that make, does the task make sense? Yeah. And are you willing and able? Are you prepared to? And it's okay to pass. Yeah. So maybe just take a couple of minutes and, and think about if you could name some of your tail feathers, who might they be? Maybe please, can you, if the rest of the group also feels it'll be helpful, go back to the previous tail for the image. Sorry, which image do you want, Alex? The generic model. The generic model, by all means. There you go. Thank you for asking. Sorry, I have a very quick, quick question. In terms of showing up, is this showing up in a positive or a negative way? Because <laughs> some of these people could have affected you negatively and you know how you show up is, you know, I, for example, schooling, I was in a boy's school and for me, men, rep masculinity represented aggression because mm -hmm. it was bullying, it was all of that kind of thing. So. That's that's my kind of idea of schooling, and to, it's almost a collective view um, yeah. of uh, in terms of script. So I just wanted to kind of clarify: are we looking for the positive, or are we looking for how we've shown up in the negative? I think it could be a mixture. Um, so what I would suggest is that maybe you look at how how you are today, what influences both positive and negative might be impacting how you are in this setting, in this collective. Yeah. Um, you know, I was quite shocked when I did this to find that, you know, I still had my mum as being a powerful figure in my gender identity. 
Um, you know, I'd done a lot of work around other aspects, but when I think about my gender identity, I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, and I think there are still some limiting aspects of how I show up relating to that. So you may have limitations, there may be some negatives, but hopefully there'll be some positives as well. Thank you. Just give me a little wave when you're done so that I know where you're at in the process. Yeah, be pleased to just say a bit more about friends and peers. Yeah, okay. So, oh, I'm just trying to get rid of a chat. So, the friend that I picked out was somebody who was there for me when I really needed support. And um, I said to her one day, I don't know how I'm ever going to repay you. Um, and she said, you don't, you pass it on. Yeah. And that had, that was so different. Yeah. To my script. Um, because my script was that there was, there was always a payment. Yeah. Um, and, and it really confronted my frame of reference, um, and and so I think it's it's maybe something that you have learned and really sucked in and taken and grabbed for yourself and thought, yes, you know, this is this is going to influence how I am in this world. Thank you. And equally, as Clive said, it could be a negative. You know, I had the most horrendous boss once. Um, and he was a bully, um, not just to me, but to many people. And, and I remember making a decision that I was not going, if I ever became a manager, I was not going to be like that. Um, so that also influenced me, albeit that it was a really hard and negative experience. So it's like, what a... What influence maybe could you identify from friends and peers? Okay, so is there anything that anyone would like to say about the process of that? I'm not going to ask you to feedback because we're going to use what you've done maybe in a little bit. But uh, if there's anything that you're holding or you want to say about the process, then it would be great to hear it. I'm, I'm happy to share. It's, so this is the first time I've um, used this model. And it got me thinking in a way I haven't done before. Um, and it's helped me identify things that I want to work on in my own life. Mm -hmm. 
as well as things that I can be appreciative of. Really nice, Alex. So that real widening of awareness in terms of um, where you might want to play, put your energy, direct your energy to. Thank you. Something um, that I noticed uh, and enjoyed was the uh, uh, my uh, the vast majority of my family is uh, lives in Wales, and so I grew up not knowing many of them. So a lot of the family oriented ones, my sort of genetic family tree was quite small to draw on. Um, but I know that I grew up with um, adopting friends as family and and it was quite fun to see some of them show up in ones that are sort of under the label of um, family oriented but realizing that they were my family and not just not just um, the friends and peers yeah so not not that blood relation but people that were in that intimate system yeah Okay, so I can hear one of my trainees in my ear saying, so what, how do we use it? Yeah, I want to, I want to apply this. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna, oh, she says, move on if I can. I'm not as proficient as Karen at the uh, technology. So if we think of the fact that each of these influences were of themselves this complex system yeah um so so they equally had different influences different impacts affecting how they interacted with us um and and in terms of leona talked about a different paradigm and looking at her stories through a different paradigm. I think sometimes if you can think of the people that influence you as being influenced themselves by a collective, that can be really powerful. Um, so so we're, I think we tend to forget that other people are in script as well. Yeah, and, and sometimes they're being autonomous, but quite often um, they are acting out from script. Um, and that can be quite permissive in terms of not rejecting the person, but maybe rejecting some of the views or attitudes or behaviors that they have. Yeah, because they may not have come from them naturally. They may have been a learned response. So when we come together as a group, and this is where I sort of started to play with how does this impact us when we're in a group? And if you think about what happens at a non-conscious level, often our interconnectedness comes about at that non-conscious level. Yeah, so there may be things that we share um in terms of our cultural societal family schooling um sexuality whatever it might be there may be things that connect us that if you like are one of our tail feathers but may not be on open display but we sense that about somebody yeah, so we can we can be having these transactions and our non-conscious is really active in the background, sort of sussing out where the connectedness might be in a group. Um, and I, I often use the example of, of two trainees I had in a group and uh, they were quite both quite reserved, um, quiet, and they really made a connection in terms of learning together. And, and as that connection became clear, they found out that they had, their families had the same religion. 
that they had had a very similar schooling experience that there were things if you like in their in their cultural past that were were there to connect them that hadn't been spoken or they didn't know about at the time um, but clearly at a non-conscious level there was something that enabled them to to feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable um, so we as a group will if you like have have started to at a non-conscious level work out where we might fit who we might fit more comfortably with um, and and how how we can feel okay enough to function and perform in this group and i think if you can bring this into a learning group or into an organizational group to bring into their awareness that there are things which are not said and are not avert which are influencing their relationships and um, their decision making in particular yeah it can start to if you like bring that psychological level more out into the open yeah, people can start to identify maybe what some of the connections are and whether they are helpful or unhelpful. People are looking very thoughtful. I was just thinking how powerful this could be used organizationally in a diversity and inclusion space, um, you know, and especially in a South African context where there is so much integration that needs to happen. And, you know, you, you speak about ethnicity and, you know, kind of script that forms around that. And I think that using this kind of model to create dialogue about what our what script has been created individually how it affects the group in a diversity and inclusion um, capacity yeah. within an organization yeah i think you're absolutely right clive it, it is a way of maybe surfacing some of the what's it the unconscious bias that people talk about isn't it, it, it it's uh, what is already there um that they take for granted that they don't question um yeah the word the word i'd had um very much aligned to what clive was saying there and, and i'd had it for a few slides was the um intersectionality was was what it was triggering in me was all the different groupings and all the different potentials there to highlight and show show difference and share difference in a hopefully positive way or an, an opening up way for right. people, enlightening way, I guess might be a nice word. Yeah, and again, it, it it's about how can you do it without people going to shame or not okay places or defensiveness? Um, it's like, how can we make it so that people see it as being normal um, and and therefore can start to articulate it. I'm getting a thinking that what we're talking about on that non-conscious level, in a sense, it's tuning into the, um, the little professor, the, the A1. And maybe when people are invited to do that, there's more sense of connection. Whereas if people are really stuck in their... Um, a2, it becomes more my way, your way stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's where the defensiveness that you've spoken about comes in. And it's I really see. allowing ourselves to tune in what's what's this deep connection that is there in intuitively. 
Yeah, and I, I, I think that's absolutely right, Karen. I think it is, it, it's really asking the little professor to, to have a voice. But I also think it, it's tuning into P1 as well. Yeah, it, it's about what are the parental influences that we've made sense of um, and not questioned, um, but have yeah. become a part of, if you like, our, our personality and it, it, an unquestioned part of our personality. Brilliant. So, yeah, thanks for that. I really, that adds another layer. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that, for me, that P1 is really important um, because it's not, when we look at the peacock, you can sometimes sort of say, okay, these are, these are interjects. They are exterior psyche. They are somebody not of myself. Um, but if we start to think about the P1, we've made that our own. Yeah, we, we've taken these external influences and made meaning of them. So they've become part, part of our core. Um, and, and as Clive says, that can often be, you know, where some of the diversity issues, um, whether it's to do with disability or ethnicity, um, can really start to open up if we recognize that we've sucked something in and made it our own without necessarily looking at it in a, either a cognitive or a feeling way. Not in the recent past anyway. Any other ideas or thoughts? Um, maybe I'm, I'm not sure if I missed something or um, I don't know. The, so when you gave the example of your the two trainees that um, seem like they um, almost like fell into step without knowing that they needed that they could fall into step with each other. And then found out that there was um, a bunch of things in their histories that got them there almost prepare mm -hmm. them for that. Um, that did sound like um, it's the the, ha the happy the happy benefit or the happy payoff of an unconscious bias, um, where there's almost like the with that there's a you've got a, a secret language almost, or you've got the, you've got the crib notes with each other. So when you, you kind of almost bounce off each other without needing to develop that language um, to get, to get to a deeper meaning or something like that. And I, so, and I see how this, this um, gives a visual representation of, of the, posit the positive opportunity of that unconscious bias. Um, and then obviously there's a, a big, a big awareness of elevating or creating awareness of unconscious bias because it's um, there seems to be so much trouble that come that can come from that when there's if the unconscious biases don't hold hands nicely with each other. Um, so I'm I don't I'm not quite okay, sure. So how do you so, start talking about that then? <laughs> okay, so if you <laughs> if you have got some unconscious bias which are unhealthy yeah um, you're saying how how can that actually result in something positive yeah um i don't think that's quite what i was saying but i'm curious as the the turn of the turn of that i'm not quite sure what i'm asking um i Okay, but let, let me let me add a bit more. So the, I, th I think this was then triggered from what Clive was saying. So it sounds like that there was a there was a happy coincidence from the the example of the trainees, 
Um, so that they, I mean, we all, we're all human, we all have unconscious bias. And it just so happened that it seemed like theirs held hands really nicely and it was a healthy, healthy, um, healthy event. Um, the unconscious bias becomes an issue when it starts to create barriers or break down communication or poison um, mm -hmm. connectivity with each other. Um, and I was wondering then if, uh, so using this kind of thing, I was remembering for myself, uh, engaging with a, a training group. I was um, a peer in the training group and there was somebody that I had a, an immediate averse response to or reaction to. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily I had the wherewithal to, to voice this with somebody and they challenged me saying, you're engaged in the training group to, to have a transformational experience. Do you really want to avoid them for the rest of the training? And and luckily with that prompt, that challenge, I realized, hang on, this is my own stuff that's getting in the way and went out of my way to, to work with them. And by the end of that training, I had realized that a significant portion of my learning had come because of this person. And, um, I, and there was a, an immense respect and rapport that had developed between the two of us. So it's almost like with this, with, with this model, it's, understanding when things when the glove fits well this is potentially why it's fitted well and when you've realized you're trying to put a sock on your hand as a glove maybe that then becomes the trigger to realize hang on maybe one of my feathers is bent out of place and i, and I can do away with it or something yeah uh, i suppose if i use this in groups i tend to work on the basis that we have we are trying to put a sock on a on a hand yeah so I gave the example of the two trainees that started to spur my thinking around this. Yeah. But actually, I think it is more, far more realistic to assume that there are people that we work with or we're in groups with who bug the hell out of us. Yeah. Um, and, and this is about actually, what is it that bugs us? You know, what is it that makes us go, <sighs> yeah? Um, you know, Leslie talked earlier about the contact doors and, and sometimes they can offer an explanation as to why somebody's focused on thinking and I just want to um, get on and do it, yeah? But equally, if you go down, you know, a further layer, there, there are things at that non-conscious level that we are drawing back from um, and and so I tend to assume that we are trying to put a sock on a, on a hand yeah and and so if we're trying to put a sock on a hand you know let's get curious about that um, you know do you want to take the sock off do you want to make the sock a different color do you want to put some fingers into the, you know how is it that we want to change um to start to feel more comfortable um within this group setting or if not more comfortable more effective yeah often in an organization it, it you don't need to be comfortable with somebody to work with them but you do need to respect them and value them um and and so this is about saying, what do we need to do with the sock? Does that make sense to other people having used that metaphor? I um, mean, it, it sort of landed with me. Um, but it, it's assuming that there will be people in groups who rub you up the wrong way, um, don't seem to pull their weight, drive you nuts, whatever. And if we take the assumption that it is likely to be a defensive pattern or a non-conscious belief that is fueling that, how do we then start to work with it? Jimmy, um, mm -hmm. I want to check. Uh, the theoretical understanding of something is is unconscious belief the same as or does it incorporate counter transference 
it incorporates. Thank yeah. You. So I think uh, non-conscious can also be. So really, actually, let me con let me ponder that one. Might need to call on Karen for some help here, um, because I think. I think it can be transferential, it can be counter-transferential. Um, the non-conscious bias is probably the, 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 the counter-transferential experience, which can be um, at all levels. So it can be bodily, it can be at feeling level, and it can be cognitively. Um, so yes. I think it would be reasonable to say that that non-conscious is counter-transferential. Would you agree, Karen? I guess I go to the place of um, almost transference and counter-transference is the original way of the more powerful pe person mm. um, is invited into counter-transference and the less powerful person does the transference and for me they almost two sides of a coin mm. um why do we differentiate between you know who starts the game uh a or b you know it's it's the hook that makes it happen um, and in you know in the co-creative ta tudors and summers talk about past me present you and present me past you, which is their way of describing the transference and counter transference. Um, and, and I suppose in, in my head, that might be um, an easier way for me to think about it. Um, you know, who's in the past here? Um, and my guess is, as you were speaking, Alex, that I went to the past and you were in the present, yeah? And then knowing that Karen was here and I could ask her actually helped me then come back to the present. So the interconnectedness actually helped then. Um, I don't understand. Uh, I'm, and I'm curious about what you mean when you say you went to the past. Okay, so um, I would say that I went to an archaic place. Yeah, have have I got the answer to Alex's question? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I can I make sense of your question and answer it in a way that is going to be um, meaningful for you? Yeah, that was. And, and that went to, so for me, that was not a present centered place. It was a past centered place. Yeah. Um, and the fact that we are connected in this group and I knew that, that Karen would be able to offer a view and be willing to offer a view actually enabled me then to come out of my past archaic place and think, and present an answer. So it's a positive, that was an example of me having a positive non-conscious connection with Karen that was supportive. Yeah, my past experience has been, yeah. So that connection enabled me to come out of that past-centered place into present-centered. Karen. I had a small piece. In mm, fact, please. I did a brief thing the same. I, I went into past centered stuff saying, oh my goodness, it's this transference, conference, transference stuff, panic. Um, but as you took the time to think about it, I came back to the present and I also knew, I think reciprocally, that what I could offer, you would also pick up and, and something interesting, useful would emerge Much. between the two of us. So I felt that brief moment of also going into a past place how did you experience it alex mm. i was hoping you'd ask <laughs> well um in this moment i'm wondering 
what is it about my physical appearance or the tone in my voice or the words that I used or even perhaps something outside of um, that like maybe the intention of my question which invited you into the past um, I'm mindful you you guessed that um, I was in the present when I asked the question but considering how it impacted you, I'm wondering about that. Um, my conscious intention was to hold two theoretical concepts next to each other in an attempt to kind of create a synthesis and mm. Connected with what I do understand. Mm. And I'm wondering if if this if there's an element of my stuff in it or if it's and my stuff entangling with your stuff or if it's not that. Um because it yeah, it's like a kind of parallel process thing may have happened. It may have done and I would prefer to refer to it as our stuff. I, I don't know that it's your stuff and my stuff. Um, and uh, I think your question landed with me very much as positive intent. And if I had to guess, I'd have said that you were seeking to um, make sense of what I was saying using transference and counter-transference. Um, if you like, um... I want to say something else that, that may mm. give you more info. So I, I have a, an unhappy relationship with the word unconscious bias. Okay. Because it, it in the ways I've seen it being used socially, ends up with playing a psychological game of uh, victim and persecutor. Okay. Um, that's not been my experience in, in how it's been in this conversation. Um, and, and the way that it's been used in this conversation led me to thinking about transference, which is... Um, Kind of a neutral phenomenon mm -hmm. in my perspective I, I heard from karen it's it has some power dynamics as, as context in the way she makes sense of it um and i i can acknowledge that um especially considering how freud used it but there was like a way of me um making the unconscious bias phrase more neutral by pairing it with something which i have found to be neutral in my own theoretical framework that's really helpful alex because i think that has unlocked why i went yeah because uh, i have um a reasonably healthy disrespect for theory and that can sometimes mean that I don't, I take liberties without realizing it. And I think you've highlighted a liberty that I need to, I need to clarify. Yeah. Because you said unconscious bias. Yeah. And that is something that is different to what I would refer to as non conscious bias. Yeah. So, uh -huh. I'm, unconscious bias is out of reach for us in a always. cognitive way um always <laughs> personally no, i would never no, say you always. kind of answered it no oh no, no. <laughs> that's holding you too, too much no um but you cleared it up when you said uh, in a cognitive way yeah yeah um 
whereas non-conscious is out of our awareness and accessible. Yeah, and if you relate it back to what where Freud talked about, you know, with psycho, I'm not even going to go there. I can't remember which one it is, but um, the the unconscious is not available to us. So you you in an organisational setting, outside of a therapeutic setting, we would not be able to access the unconscious. But the non-conscious is accessible and can be brought into awareness. Mm. Yeah. So there is a difference. And, and I feel I was sloppy in, in the way that I use terminology, because if I said unconscious, then I was wrong. Um, it should be non-conscious. Maybe I wasn't paying enough attention and me bringing in the word We'll have to listen to the recording to find out. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I also so, note that, that when I introduced my question, I started with, in like the first 10 words, I, I said theory. So maybe that yeah. um, was an unpleasant reminder for you. Yeah. 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 But it's really helpful because for me, unconscious is deeply buried in the psyche. Non-conscious is available to, to bring into awareness. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That got into a bit of a deep discussion. Thank you for that, Alex. That's that was really helpful. Where are other people at? I'm in a lost place, if I'm being honest. I I haven't followed much of that. Um, okay. And I I've decided to put that down to my being a more novice at, at TA and that it'll all come in the future. So I was I was okay for a while, but I lost I lost that piece. I lost I'm it completely. Honest, yeah. All right, yeah. Thank you for that, Leslie. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's part of the process that it's useful to bring up and explore because otherwise you've got the potential for it going off course and becoming a game. So I think it's helpful in the process. To, to have a look at it. And I get what you're saying in terms of terminology and depth. So, so it's not about terminology and depth because I can understand terminology and depth. For me, it's about losing the signposting of where we are in the session and where we're going. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Let, let's bring yeah. that, let's come back to the session and where we're going. The information that your peacock feathers that you drew out, are you up for having another little exercise with those? Yeah. So my invitation to you is to um, think about you in a collective that you participate or lead. Yeah? So it could be this group, it could be a training group, it could be a piece of your work. And, and which of your tail feathers um, support you and help you be seen for you and what you want to offer? And um, which of your tail feathers support you in asking for what you want and and how you are in that and are there any Clive you talked about tail feathers that had a negative impact are there any that you would like to transform change um, choose differently for Yeah. Are there some aspects that you would like to keep and some aspects that you would like to discard? So maybe just take a few minutes to have a ref have a thought.
Okay. So, have a think about whether you're happy to share, and I would be really curious to, um, to have your thoughts either on the process or the outcome. Leona. Yeah, it's really interesting as well. What comes up for me is that, um, sorry, there's somebody with a saw. I don't know if it's disturbing, is it? We can hear you clearly okay. over the top of it. Okay, good. Sorry, I was moving the whole time. <laughs> but what came up for me was that, um, you know, the feathers, to, uh, feathers supporting me to ask for what I want, that I'm thinking, gosh, uh, I don't really know where they are or where that is. So if I would want to change something, uh, I'd have to search for that feather. Mm. And I'm thinking, so it must be there somewhere, but um, apparently I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Does it make sense? It does absolutely make sense. Um, and you come across as being fairly potent and autonomous for asking for things that you want. So, you know, my guess is that it may be something that you don't have a strong need for. And I would be really curious as to where you built those skills um, and how you got to a place where you were able to do that. Mm. Yes and no, because it's, uh, I can do a lot, uh, but at the same time that also, um, as a consequence, I just I just go over my my own limits, and okay. also it's about um, uh, being aware that uh, I can let go. So there's there's an anxiety there some somehow that it's like oh gosh I need to I need to take care of this because it might go wrong. So um, I think the connection is um, if I if I give myself permission to ask for support, then I have to get let go of this anxiety that it might go wrong. Mm. This is just what comes up in comes here up. and now for me. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So it's really interesting. I'm just, I'm just thinking, where, where, where is that feather? You know, where is it where that, is I, that? that, that, um, that actually does give me permission to say, okay, now you can relax. It's okay. Don't mm. worry. Yeah. Fantastic. Really lovely insight, Leona. I, um, I quite enjoyed um, this prompt and was curious about the, the nature of the three bullet points that you gave uh, to prompt us and that, and that maybe another conversation at some stage is how you <laughs> came up with those but for me in this in this exercise it was interesting to start to kind of fan through the the feathers almost and try to identify where some of these things live with some of them and who did that feather relate to um, and then there's some other parts where we're noticing okay maybe there's something missing here and then who else can I look to to maybe go and find an, another feather and try and stick it in with a bunch um, and um, then with little bits of some of them noticing that maybe there was through through development, noticing that was a potentially a lack and growing my own feather to in some shape or form to to fill the vo void. Mm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think there's that embodiment of physis in the in the peacock itself, you know, I, I think don't discount the things that you your uniqueness brings it doesn't always have to come from somebody else um and i think thinking about if if you were to grow that tail feather what might it look like what might it feel like what color would it be um you know it could be really exciting to to explore that And I think that, oh, I haven't got a tail feather for that, 
is is insightful um, because if we think of our development needs as we grow there there sometimes are elements of our development which we didn't get our needs met completely with um, and we don't know how to um, so actually going out and exploring that and finding um, how we might get that need met now um, can be really potent as well. I looked at a, a few different groups that I'm involved in and I realized that I show different feathers more in some groups than others. And it's got me to think now, where's the, the energy, the system that wisely enables me to sh choose which feathers to show in which group um, mm. so that it meets the co-created desired intention for the different groups that I'm in. Mm. That, that's why, where I'm left quite thoughtfully. Yeah, I think when you are really seeking to co-create, it is it is not always your decision about which feathers are needed. <laughs> it, it's yeah. it's almost like how do we how do we create a fan of, of feathers between us um, that works for the group? And so some, I suppose what I'm saying is sometimes the feathers we choose to show are strongly influenced by um, the resources and the makeup of the group. I think it's really helpful, Debbie, because uh, it's as if um, my recent, uh, recent uh, experience is with a dear colleague of mine, who actually um, really noticed, like, okay, Leo, now it's time for you to let go because it's, you know, you're getting into a space that's not healthy for you. And so she has the feather of care. And um, and and she, I mean, I could totally accept it from her. So yeah. it's really nice because then she, you know, it we we sort of co-created this and uh, it's also about acceptance. Uh, can you accept that somebody else actually says to you, right, and now it's it's time for you to let go, and also created uh, the, the possibility uh, to do that. So, you know, it's, it's really nice to, to think of it that way, uh, mm. that you can co-create or create feathers so that you don't have to do it all by yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. And, and, and I think that's where the interconnectedness and the entwining comes in. Um, that actually we don't as individuals need to be all things. Um, that we are, you know, by, a, by being able to rely and call and share and accept, um, actually it, it, that's when the individual becomes part of the collective. Anybody else? I'm really conscious of the time and that we're running out of time. I do have one more slide. And as I say, I will let you have these. But the, the next part of my thinking was about if we were to look at this in terms of attributes, sorry, lost where I am. Um, oh, there we go. Um, if we were to look at this within an organization and attributes of either the organization or the individual, um, what aspects might we be looking at in terms of organizational script? Um, what might be the strengths? What might be the weaknesses? So if we were to look at these, not in terms of 
individuals as influences, but in terms of um, skills, attributes, opportunities, um, then again, this can shift. And you can actually take this and look at it from an, an organizational script as well, which is slightly different. Um, but if we were to look at these as characteristics of people, um, it may help us, if you like, identify how we grow some of the tail feathers that we want. So I leave that with you. As I say, I will let you have the slides. Um, but I wanted to, for those of you that work in organisations, um, it may be a little more fodder for you. Oops. No, stop share. Won't let me stop. There we go. So, guys, I think we're out of time. And I'm wondering whether those of you that had got nuggets that you wanted to get, whether you've got them and generally how, how you experience the session. Well, I'll go first, <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's just, it's for me. It's like it's just a um, a beginning. So there's there's more to explore, and and it's been very helpful to go and to actually go into myself and understand it before, um, before before uh, going to other to to others. I would say, but it's it's a nice process to do together, and. Um, but I'm just curious. So I think I, I'd like to explore some more with you, Debbie. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks, Diana. I'm wondering um, with an eye on time, if there's a maybe one or two more voices um, to share their experience. Um, and then to be, for us to take leave of this, this space. Mm. Maybe, uh, and everyone else, thank you for today. Um, it's been a refreshing and insightful perspective on self and what's influenced me, and I will take it forward as well. Thanks. Pooja, you unmuted yourself. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I think, um, the particular experience uh, where uh, the aspect of past me and present you, uh, the conversation around that, uh, and the last activity uh, really trickled a lot of thoughts for me. So I'm taking back a lot. So uh, like Leon mentioned, uh, it's just a starting point again uh, to add another layer to this concept. And that's what I'm taking back. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Good to hear you. It feels like I've got so much more to explore. Um, so I took a picture of the questions and I thought I actually want to sit and go through this properly because I started off in a very personal place and ended up in well, also a personal place, but with my business owner hat on and wanted to look at things about my what will one day be organization. You know, so it was, yeah, it was so interesting. Um, so just thank you for provoking a lot of thinking in me. Um, yeah. Thank you, Kirsty. And, and as I say, you could have the slide so you can see the questions.
again echo, echoing the thanks around the room, Debbie. Um, the, the, gold, the golden nuggets uh, are definitely there, and I'm busy thinking about the various feathers and the the plucking of pheasants, which doesn't necessarily sound particularly <laughs> nice, and the, the the entwining of feathers and all sorts. But there's it's triggered thoughts and. Uh, Typically, what I do is I go off and uh, in the middle of the night, I, I come up with the answer that I'm seeking out. And I just I always just trust my process on, mm. on that piece in relation to take, taking my learning away and, and grabbing it. So I absolutely know you stimulated something there for me. So thank you very much. I'm really pleased, Leslie. Thank you. Brief. Thanks, Debbie. I've really enjoyed a longer learning um, engagement with you within a group. Uh, lots of food for thought as well of what I want to think about more deeply. Brilliant. Well, thank you. I've had tremendous fun um, and it's it's been lovely to to meet those of you that I haven't met before and to have more contact with those that I have met but not spent time with recently so uh, so yeah brilliant thank you so to be with my SATAA hat back on um i want to thank you for making yourself available and for sharing your experience and your wisdom in this space and um, for myself i really enjoyed um this experience today and i think what you created is a real experience um right from the beginning from the get-go um noticing how you are um, walking your talk with us um, and immediately feeling invited and engaged to show up um, and do some valuable work. Um, so thank you again. Oh, brilliant. Thank um, and you, And thank you for your, for your offer of sharing the slides and we will um, make the, um, send that through to the people that have re registered for this event. Lovely. Thank you. Go and enjoy you. your curiosities and your exploring. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.